Welcome to Talking Africa, a special weekly edition of Africa Wrap, where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world in an hour of conversation with African commentators and thought leaders. Time now to welcome my first guest today. Aleem Kamara is a hip-hop artist based in London and originally from Sierra Leone, a country long known for its storytelling and its art. However, recently it's become known for its resilience in the face of the Ebola outbreak, which is estimated to have taken the lives of more than 10,000 people. Aleem is here to tell us more about the current situation in Sierra Leone. But for now, let's take a look at his education work in action in his home country before the outbreak began. Hip-hop reinvented me and my career was formed. But the yearning to do more is never far from my thoughts. What would that be? A scholars. A scholars was created to support education and well-being. This begins in West Africa, Sierra Leone, in a village called Binti. As soon as I made the decision, the gateways just opened. And of course, Aleem is here with me. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. When were you last able to visit Sierra Leone, uh, and in the light of this current outbreak of Ebola? Last year, January. Um, so watching that video is quite emotional for me, because uh, when you think about the children that we connected with whilst we were over there, and then just actually now wondering which one of those children are okay, who, how many of them have been affected directly. Have you kept in touch with some of those children? Yeah, 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 we have. We've actually got, um, we get texts from them and we contact um, two of the older ones um, over there who keep us updated on what's going on. And what's it been like for you seeing those awful reports coming through on, on the situation uh, or the, the, the absolute, you know, problem of, yeah. of Ebola in Sierra Leone? I mean, it's painful, it's devastating, because you're, when a phone call comes from back home, you don't know what the news is going to be. Because Ebola just, it seems to just randomly pick people um, to attack. So you don't actually know. And it's funny because I was at the O2 once, and um, a, a friend of mine who was with me, a girl came up to her, she's like, oh, let me give you a hug. She's like, as long as you don't have Ebola. And it made me realize that there is such a desensitization mm. from people who are not directly connected. Whereas coming from there and being so connected with people from there, having your family affected by it, it pains you a lot more. You know, so when you look at what's going on around the world, say Syria, you can never relate directly. But all of a sudden, when it's close to home, you feel it a lot more. That's a very important point you, you've made there. And, of course, we, we saw those pictures of you with children in, in Sierra Leone, uh, and you founded a charity, which we're going to look at a little more closely later on. Mm -hmm. But your, your charity was essentially focusing on education. That's right. How has its ability to carry out those educational uh, functions and charity work being affected by this outbreak? Well, it's paused it. It's, it's paused it for now because we go every year since the charity um, started. And what that has meant is we weren't able to go this year because our charity is about when we go, we hand everything hand to hand to the children. So here's your pencil, here's your pen. His, we're paying for your school fees and it's in front of everybody rather than sending money over blindly and not knowing what happens with the money. So, so how much of a challenge, given your experience with, you know, educating children in Sierra Leone, how much of a challenge will it be getting Sierra Leone's children back to the educational levels that they were at before this outbreak began, you, using your own experience as an example? My own experience? We've got to start with emotional intelligence first. I think what's going to happen is that children are going to get told, you can go back to school now. 
but are they, is there, is there something going to happen in terms of how has this effect, affected them emotionally? So I think that's what first of all needs to happen because before this, children in, in Sierra Leone and a lot of schools were actually soaring, they were doing very well. So now this is only taking a hit back when you look at where we were just getting up, rising up from the Civil War to now being here. So it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of work. And, and of course, of the, the, those schools are due to open this March. Yes. Or, or perhaps some of That's them have it, already opened. Well, it's, they've said March the 30th. That's right. what they're aiming. But again, because you have direct contact sometimes, there are rumors that it could be pushed back down further. Because what they're doing at the moment is they are training um, master trainers. I think they're training like 14 trainers to train 420 teachers who are going to train more. And we're looking at what? 30 districts mm -hmm. and then you're looking at 36,000 teachers that are going to be need to be taught in terms of safe reopening of schools and of course that means a lot of money uh, the UK and other Western countries have donated generously to the Ebola effort do you think the amount of money they sent was generous enough I mean at this current moment in time any money that can be sent is well appreciated what I would say is for the money to be monitored and that's one of the reasons why we go on the ground. I want like monitor this money. Who's getting this money? Who's who's making sure that it's going to the people? That is going to the nurses and the doctors who are working so hard. Um, who's going to make sure that it's going to the teachers so that we're not facing um, mm. certain situations in the future? Briefly, what lessons do you think we've learned, in, or, or that people in Sierra Leone have learned following this outbreak? That we need to tighten up infrastructure. We need to make sure that we improve the health system in Sierra Leone. That's, that's very much, like this could have been, um, it could have been contained. So now we need to look at, okay, why was it not contained? So we, we've, I think the lesson that we've learned is that our health system could be a lot better. Okay, stay with us, Aleem. We'll take a very short break here. But when we come back, we'll be finding out more about Aleem's other work, which has put him in the spotlight, in particular, his own modern take on a traditional West African storytelling technique. Stay with us. The best way to predict the future is to create it. There's a special breed of achievers out there called tomorrow's people. They imagine what will be and strive to make it happen. They refuse to wait for the future. Tomorrow bends and conforms to their ideas. At Access Bank, we share the same sentiments. Our mantra for success is simple. Speed, service, and security. Tomorrow's people own the future because they keep the world turning. That is the power of taking tomorrow. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue conversation with my guest this week, philanthropist and hip-hop artist Aleem Kamara. Well, aside from your hip-hop career, um, you, which obviously is, is quite, you know, well-known, you've been touring schools and universities, you, you've also been popularizing the traditional West African storytelling art form known as Griot. Yes. We're about to take a look at you in action, telling a story of a young girl going through a hard time. So her mother places a carrot, an egg, and some coffee beans into boiling water. Let's take a look. Each of these objects have faced the same adversity. They've all gone through the same thing, boiling water. But each of them have reacted differently. You see, the carrot went in strong. But after being subjected to the boiling water, what happened? It became soft. The inside of the egg is fragile, so naturally, there's a thin outer shell to protect the liquid interior. But after sitting inside the boiling water, for those of you who know how to boil egg, <laughs> what happened is inside hardened. The ground coffee beans, however, are different. After they had been in the water, they had changed the water. Which are you, she asked her daughter. When trials and tribulations come knocking on your door, how do you respond? Are you a carrot, <laughs> an egg, or a coffee bean? And of course, Aleem is with us here. Tell us more about your tradition, your take on this traditional form of African storytelling. 
Oh, wow. I grew up around storytelling. We're talking stars at night, crickets and fire, um, and having storytellers come and share stories with us that taught us morals, that taught us ethics. And when I came over to the, to the UK, that changed, and it, it's, its change was hip-hop. Its development, it advanced in, in the form of hip-hop. And that's, that's where it started. And then when I went to university, I'd forgotten about the old traditional style storytelling, because here it was all more Mickey Mouse and, um, and Donald Duck. And then when I was finishing my third year at uni, um, my lecturer said to me, why don't you do a storytelling module? Because you get to pick certain modules. And I went and done it. And all of a sudden, I decided to tell a story about a character known as Na uh, Nancy from West Africa, Ghana, Kwekwe Nancy. And nobody had heard of a Nancy. OK, a Nancy, is that the spider? Or That's something? the spider, okay, yes, 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 the, the trickster, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I was shocked, because for me, it's like everybody mm. knows a Nancy. And so then it was a thing of, wow, this is slowly fizzling away. So somebody needs to do something. And often they say, if you see a, an issue and it, and it urges you, mm. then it usually means that you're part of the solution. But I suppose the question is, how do the children in schools in London react to that sort of sto storytelling? Oh, they love it. We all, OK, watch this, Charles. If I say to you, guess what happened to me today? All of a sudden, all of your senses open up. What happened? So we well, all love like storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, it is, it is. All of us love storytelling. There's that child in us mm. that loves that, that storytelling. So I go in and fuse it with rap um, and ancient traditional storytelling, and I get to introduce them to that That's culture. That's brilliant. And of course, you, you, as you said, you were exposed to this as a child. Yeah, and and yeah. so it's, 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 it's an intrinsic part of who you are, definitely, isn't it? Definitely. Now, do you think the power of story, storytelling that you encompass mm -hmm. in your talks yes. um, is still alive as a tradition back home in Sierra Leone? Not as much as it should be. Um, strangely enough, I think back home, they are trying to copy more the Western style mm. of teaching and delivery. And that's more teacher in front, children sit down, listen, mm. I talk, that's it. Whereas we come from a more animated form of, of, of teaching. So and what uh, other issues do you cover in your talks? I mean, we noticed you were talking to students and things. Yes. Like, what do you cover when you talk to so them? So I'm looking at education, so fusing hip-hop and English. So I will do with primary schools, I might do something like a noun is the name of anything, like house, garden, toy, swing. Instead of nouns, you may prefer the pronouns you, I, or her. Mm. So all of a sudden now I'm rapping and at the same time teaching. And they're enjoying it, and Sounds they're loving it. I love it. I, love I wouldn't mind going to one of your classes. Oh, you're welcome. Perhaps I could learn a few things there. Now, <laughs> you also use humour yes. in a lot of your talks. I mean, is this a conscious decision? Do you feel it captures the attention of young people better? Definitely. We all love a good laugh, if, um, and especially for a lot of the children who, like I said, um, in class, they don't feel like they can mm. laugh. It's a very structured yes, environment. that's the it? word. So that's give us an structure. example of what you would do to make them laugh. So I'm, uh, and this is a beautiful thing. I might come into a class now, but I love what I do for a living. I wake up in the morning, I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that will make <laughs> it. Right. So that, and it's like, wow, all of a sudden I've broken the ice. Because when you get in front of the children, they ask themselves a question. Mm. Who are you? Why should I listen to you? Like, why should well, I trust absolutely. you? absolutely. Who are you? I mean, wh where on earth are you coming from? Yes. Why are we being made to sit to here? To sit here. Yeah. yeah. And watch so, this bearded chap with a bald head. That's right. And sometimes you, you're... And what will happen is, from the moment they enter, I will mm. start playing music. So I'm already... Although it's their school, I already, I'm already starting to own the space mm. that they're coming into. And I'm like, right, now it's our space. Let's have fun and let's learn at the same time. Brilliant. And, and of course, you, you've had lots of these sessions. What yes. would you say is the most memorable and why? The most memorable was sometimes you go into a school and you randomly pick a young person. And we got this girl up on stage and she told us about what she wanted to do in the future. We're like, whoa, brilliant. And we had fun on stage. And then afterwards, she came up to me and she said, um, all this week I've been contemplating suicide. But as a result of you coming to my school and letting me know that I am good enough and it's possible for me to achieve my goals and dreams, that's what I'm going to do. 
That is absolutely that extraordinary. Is. Yeah. Now, uh, Alim, stay with us. It's time for another short break here. But when we come back, we'll be discussing Alim's transition from young boy queuing up to buy hip-hop CDs in Crouch End to sharing a stage with everyone from Beyonce to Tony Blair. Please stay with Talking Africa. We're back in a moment. There is a reason Africa is called the new frontier. What was once potential is now an opportunity ready to be seized. Once revered for our resources, today's wealth lies in our people. People who build the cities that shape the future. People who know an idea in one place means business in another. A generation for whom technology means there are no borders, no boundaries. We are the new lions in a brave new world. Kings of the urban jungle. And there's a bank that puts the world in our pocket and the future in our hands. UBA, Africa's global bank. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue the conversation with my guest this week, hip-hop artist and philanthropist Aleem Kamara. But before we go any further, let's take a look at one of your best-known tracks. Spray noise like a cockadoo morning, music I was born in. Apparently my papa was a drummer boy calling, home alone talking. Around these times it's starting to trickle cokes in. T's dad gave us licks for shoplifting Best Oprah foods we ever had Wiping tears Just a snippet of the path to my career Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song From my wonder years I grew to be strong Spinning style Still looking for my olive though Hey yo I just want to stay away from just being so paro Little cousins making 30 plus And you ain't blow you ain't How blow. many more shows can you do for no dough? Aleem there doing some of his favorite stuff and of course well, that's capturing the imagination of lots of people we mentioned earlier that you were an avid hip-hop fan from a young age and that you were queuing up to buy CDs yes. what CDs were you actually queuing up to buy? Oh, to you're gonna make me reveal this Charles <laughs> you're gonna make me reveal this please okay so at nine my cousin and I would go outside this shop called Our Price. Doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. This is back 
back in back in. I think I remember our, our price, price yes, yeah? red red side. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, it would the CD that we wanted would have parental advisory, so we were not allowed to have that CD. So we would have the exact change and beg strangers to go into our <laughs> price and buy a CD, like buy the CD for us and we would run home to listen to it. And then, yeah, when um, we knew mum was coming, we'd put it under the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about hip hop that appealed to you so much? Hip identity. I mean, coming to, again, coming to the UK, when you wake up, you put on the TV, you don't see anything that related to you. We had, I think we had Desmond and Cosby show. Yes, I remember and, Desmond. Right. Um, it wasn't the most exciting show in the it world. It wasn't, but it was something that it was like, oh my yeah. gosh, they look like me. And so there was that connection there, um, trying to find a place, especially if you, you're coming from back home where mm. you're used to seeing people of more um, that look like you, more cultural. So you... You were searching for that, and then I would go to my cousin's house, and he'd be watching MTV Raps, and he introduced me to hip hop, and I was like, wow! And it was hip hop was fearless. It's all, just to quickly d mm. d give an analogy. It's like being imagine being bullied on the playground, and then somebody comes and says, "Don't touch him. He's good enough. He's strong enough. He's great." And you look up, and it's hip hop. Hip hop is fearless. Hip hop is its expression. So I suppose that was what, what was, um, the, was what one it, of the big attractions. Yes. But of course, the it, it, I mean, there must have been some reaction from your family when you decided that you were going to go the way of hip hop. I mean, we, you know, your mother yeah. is a big influence in your life. But yes. the question is, did she support your going into hip hop as a profession? She supported, but she was concerned. I would say definitely she was concerned. She was worried as to how it would affect me educate in my in my education. Now other family members, oh, that's where the whispers started. If you're coming from an African background, it's like doctor, lawyer, yeah, engineer, yeah, you're that, wasting your life. So when I said I wanted to do it, and I was scared for a while to actually pursue um, the dream, but I mean the looks of absolute the, horror. Like yes. he says he's gonna be and the way they'd say uh, this, he's gonna be playing in a band. Yes. And what could be more horrific? <laughs> but now guess what, child? Now I'm on TV. Mm. They're like, that's my nephew. Absolutely. So now they're so they, they they getting now. Wanting yes. to make the association. Yes. And of course, it looks like you've got competition in the family because, I mean, a new video <laughs> of your son my, rapping my, at two years old went viral and was shown on the US TV show Ellen. Let, let's just have a quick wait. look at that. Come on. Of course, that is your nephew, yes. not your, not your son. son. I don't want to cause any no, sort of... What, it's any... what Ellen did, so I actually had family members who, you did not tell me you had his son. I was like, it's not my yeah, son. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't want to be, be the one who would sort of make a revelation, especially when it isn't actually true. That's your, 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 your nephew. That's right, yeah. Uh, but you've shared the stage with some amazing names, including yes. Beyonce. Um, I would love to share the stage with her. <laughs> um, but, but what's been your most memorable performance? I mean, and, and perhaps the, the people you performed with and so on. Oh, well, in terms of memorable performance, I would say last year I headlined at London's Jazz Cafe. So that was a big thing mm. for me because the f previous year I was a supporting opening act. So a year later to be a headline act, there was a big thing for me. Now, what advice would you give to young people starting out in the position that you were? Um, go out there and fail. Sounds crazy. And then scrape yourself <laughs> off the ground and start again. Sort well, of it's that whole thing of you fall so you can learn to get back up. So nowadays, you've been told if you, if you fail, you're not good enough. Mm. And that's the thing, how we learn is by failing. How we learn is by making the mistakes. So make the mistakes, but at the same time, take the small little steps mm. to get to where you need to be. So if I wanted to see you 
or our audience wanted to catch you performing, where would we be able to do that? Well, on the 29th of March, I will be launching my EP official release, and it's entitled The Great Man. Right. And that will be at Floripa Old Street. But what people can do is visit my website, alimkamara.com. Or you, you also, okay, sorry, go on. Or they can download my app for free, and it's called Alim Kamara. Brilliant. And you also have a single. Letter to Sierra Leone, yes, featuring Silverstone. That's right. That's out later this year. Tell yes. us a bit about that. That is um, uh, me sending a message to Sierra Leone and saying, "Look, let's stand up." The the chorus the chorus simply goes, "If you not teacher, I beg you teach well. If you not leader, I beg you lead well, because the future they now we hand in my words, the future is in our hands." Mm. One finger, no, they pick stone. So in other words, one finger can't pick up a stone. So let's come together and make it work. Let's That's come excellent. together and make it happen. Do I detect the pull of politics there? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Could well, be. Could be pointing a little, you know, just to say, it's, it's, for every, it's for everybody. It's for the people, it's for those in politics, it's for the musicians. Like, only way we can make this happen is if we work together. Aleem, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. My thanks to Aleem Kamara, our special guest for this week. Stay with us to meet this week's Talking Africa panel as we look back at the week that's been, the big stories, the big issues. We continue the conversation in London right here after this short break. Trust Bank will be there now and into the future because you're at the heart of everything we do. Guarantee Trust Bank, proudly African, truly international.
thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zenith, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion. Listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance. The most customer-focused bank in Nigeria. A success built on three foundations dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back to Talking Africa with me, Charles Anyakolu, picking up the conversation. A special weekly edition of Africa Wrap, where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world in an hour of conversation with African commentators and thought leaders. I'm joined now by the broadcaster and analyst Princess Deon and Douglas Pollen from the Association for African-Owned Businesses here in London. Thanks to both of you for coming in. We'll look back now at some of the major themes and big stories that have been coming out of Africa this last week. Now, half of all children in Niger under the age of five are stunted by malnutrition, with the population of this desperately poor country due to double in the next 18 years. The race is on to improve nutritional education before it is too late. Robert Leslie reports. Hajara's daughter is just one month old, but a shortage of milk in the early days of her life left her critically ill. At birth, she wouldn't feed, and there was no more milk, so we had nothing. She wouldn't stop crying. Babies arriving at this hospital in Niger's capital, Niame, with acute malnutrition are given an emergency dose of glucose solution to restore blood sugar levels and ultimately save the child's life. It's estimated that this year, one million children in Niger which remains one of the least developed countries in the world, will be affected by the condition. The result of a deadly mix of food scarcity, poor hygiene and ignorance surrounding nutrition and the importance of exclusive breastfeeding. Mothers don't know at what age they should wean their children. According to our customs, as soon as a woman falls pregnant and if she then breastfeeds, the grandmothers come and grab the little ones to be with them. That's a major cause of malnutrition. It's above all ignorance. Niger has the fastest growing population on the planet, due to double its current 17 million in just 18 years. For those looking to combat malnutrition, this also means a massive scaling up of medical centers and education programs. With this growth, we'll have an impossible situation on our hands if we limit ourselves to treatment alone. For a while, we've been putting more emphasis on prevention as well as treatment. This means education and the changing of bad habits that have been passed down the generations. Aishita's 16-month-old has been receiving a nutritional supplement for three weeks now and is out of danger. The day I first brought him here, he was ill. I went to buy medicine on the street and then took him to hospital. They cared for him and thanks to God, he's better. He's put on weight. With fighting against Boko Haram insurgents on its eastern border and a demographic time bomb ticking within, health workers know that they're engaged in a race against the clock to save Niger's most vulnerable. Well, as we can see from that report, acute malnutrition is expected to affect one million children in Niger. Um, my guests, Deon and Princess Deon and Douglas Pollen, are, are here. Uh, I suppose you, you just saw that video. Um, I charter the young girl in the video received nutritional supplements for around three weeks and is now in the clear. So what that suggests that the treatment process um, to battle malnutrition is relatively simple. The problem is that the facilities simply aren't there. The government hasn't provided those facilities, Douglas. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very sad reality um, because I think um, putting infrastructure in place, I mean, I mean, to control the number of deaths is something that can be easily done, easily done, because um, many of these countries are not as poor as they appear to be. Money is coming in, but it's going where it's not supposed to go. I mean, it's going into the wrong pockets. Mm. 
into your wrong bank account. And um, unfortunately, you've got like this level of collateral damage. The innocents on the streets, the young children, um, are the ones who ultimately pay the price. While someone is buying a Maserati in, in the UK somewhere or or in Washington DC. Well, don't yeah. look at me. <laughs> but I mean, the, the point really is that uh, Princess Daniel, that from that report, uh, acute malnutrition is expected to affect, um, broadly speaking, around one million children in Niger. Um, what is, I suppose, most galling is that it's the aid agencies talking about these statistics and not the government of Niger. That in itself, Charles, is very heart-wrenching and heartbreaking that a whole nation cannot put a mirror in front of themselves and see exactly where they're at and try to find out how did we even get here. Okay, now we know how we got here. How can we retrace our steps and try to at least start making amends? We do know that there's no magic to mending anything. You have to start step by step. So the first thing is, are they in denial? Are they not aware that they have a problem? So that's the first thing to really check out. Secondly, if they are aware that they have a problem, why are they not doing anything about mm. it? Why must an aid agency from elsewhere come to tell you or come to analyze how things are being run in your country or the state of affairs of your country? So it's wake up time for, for, for the leadership in Niger. That's a very good point. And the fact, of course, is that that is the way things are at the moment. So the next logical question is, will the aid agencies be able to cope? Um, I, to be to be honest, I don't think so because this is not the first time or the second time like Niger has been in this position. Just as recently as 2010, um, there was a drought in Niger, and um, um, th then the figures were much lower. Uh, but even then, the aid agency struggled to cope with the demand, and sadly, I don't think they'll be able to do that this time because, I mean. It's a very big number. Mm. It's a big of course, number. At yeah. the moment, um, Niger is mired in the fight against Boko Haram, which I suppose to Nigeria and for the security of West Africa and the in protection of the interests of other nations that have sort of business in the place, it's good news because there does appear to be, um, you know, the, the battle now seems to be going in favor of the Nigerians and their coalition partners and against Boko Haram. However, people are asking the question, should the, 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 the Nigerian government be concentrating on fighting Boko Haram rather than fighting hunger within its own country? Well, it's a case of six on one side, half a dozen on the other. When um, Niger probably looks at itself, maybe they also want to protect their own territory from Boko Haram, as it were. So that's one way to look at it. But secondly, how can I leave the headache that I have and put ointment for mending the leg on mm. my head. It's not going to solve my headache mm. problem. And, and the other issue, of course, is that uh, Niger has the fastest growing population on the planet. Um, it's due to double its current 17 million population by 2033. Does it not need to urgently find a way to limit its birth rate through, for example, <laughs> employing some kind of you know, edu you know, sort of educating its people and so on. Yeah, I think I think that is where the focus should be because when this population, uh, when the population doubles, it has the potential to sink the whole ship. And we are talking about the situation where we've got about a million children malnourished. Imagine when it's when the population doubles. I mean, this is an already struggling government with no infrastructure, no hospitals, no schools. No, nothing. What would happen? I mean, when this happens. And I know we, we seem to be painting a really sort of dark picture here, but, but <laughs> sadly, <laughs> you've got the violence in northern Nigeria. A lot of refugees moving away from there into, into Niger, Niger, swelling the population and um, creating bigger problems. Yeah, Charles, it, it's, a, it's a really dark picture. I mean, I don't think there's any way you can exaggerate it because um, of the... I also believe that it might be very dire circumstances, but it is the truth. That is how it is. It so what is do you think should is. be done in the short term, in the immediate term, to deal with this? In the princess? immediate term, my heart goes to the children. You know, those children, why would they just be left to, to, to starve and not have any care? Because obviously their, their parents, most, most especially the mothers, are helpless. Because as Douglas said, and you also reiterated, there's nothing in place.
So ultimately, it'll be the aid agencies. We'll take a short break here, but when we come back, we'll be talking about protesters taking to the streets in South Africa over eviction. Stay with us. There is a reason Africa is called the new frontier. What was once potential is now an opportunity ready to be seized. Once revered for our resources, today's wealth lies in our people. People who build the cities that shape the future. People who know an idea in one place means business in another. A generation for whom technology means there are no borders, no boundaries. We are the new lions in a brave new world. Kings of the urban jungle. And there's a bank that puts the world in our pocket and the future in our hands. UBA, Africa's global bank. Welcome back to Talking Africa. Violence erupted in Johannesburg this week as protesters took to the streets over evictions in the city. The demonstrations were sparked after eviction notices were served on residents whose homes had been sold. Those protesting say they've nowhere else to go. The streets were left littered with burning tires, broken glass and large stones as residents sang and danced amid a cloud of black smoke. Police fired rubber bullets to prevent protesters from marching to the mayor's office. Well, I'm joined again by Princess Deo and Douglas Paulina. How do you think all this started? Obviously, um, people who are angry would react, especially people who've had their roofs carted off, as it were. First of all, my question would be, how did they acquire those dwelling places or properties in the first place? Was it a government... Um, project that gave them houses that like we have here in England or do they own the properties and if you own a property why should government take your property except there's some illegal situation somewhere there well I think the big issue is that you've got a massive squatter problem in South Africa I understand that there's some 80,000 squatter places I mean in other words illegally occupied buildings and all that sort of thing across South Africa sometimes you find that up to a hundred people are living in one house and sharing one sort of bathroom. Um, so the, the question is, should the government be concentrating on finding new homes for those people, or should it be concentrating on evicting those people? Um, I think it should be um, a balance of both, because development is a good thing. But at the same time, we need to remember that it's a country where there's an emerging new middle class, and. Um, the ruling party has not lived up to the expectations of the people that put them there. I believe this problem started over 20 years ago when expectations were very high. And then now people are seeing that what they expected after probably many of their relatives gave their lives is not what they are getting now. And I must say that the government have actually been keen to point out that those buildings do not belong to the municipality. They're privately owned, from the note I've just seen here. Uh, a government official explained to the, to the crowds today, but that did not stop the protesters from mm -hmm. taking to the streets. So in that sense, you're right. The people feel that um, even if these are privately owned buildings, the government has a responsibility to find mm -hmm. homes for them. So maybe there is um, a huge lack of social housing in, well, there is. in, in, in South Africa. And we can see that it's like a carryover of um, during the apartheid days where, you know, especially the, the, the Af real Africans, you know, the native Africans had nowhere to stay and they were squatted all over the place. Mm. So now the, the, the number has doubled or tripled or quadrupled. And therefore there is a danger looming um, I believe that the protests we've seen and we've heard and read about is probably just a, a tip of the iceberg. Right. Now, the other big issue, which I'm sure people who've got, uh, I mean, people across Africa can relate to, is that a lot of South Africans took to the streets for other reasons, you know, and, and primarily for um, uh, the electricity being cut off. <laughs> Um, they, 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 a local clinic was apparently set on fire, and this was in response to uh, the energy company Red Ant saying that people were illegally tapping 
electricity. And that is something that happens across places like Nigeria, for Absolutely. example. And one of the big issues, of course, across Africa is, is power. Absolutely. And I think what tends to happen is people in Africa blame the government for everything. I mean, <laughs> the government is ultimately responsible. If you can't knock someone down, why didn't, why didn't they put the speed limits there? Why is there no mm. bump on the road to, stop, to have stopped the car? You actually see people eating a banana, take the banana peel, chuck it out the window, and say, well, this government's hopeless. They don't Absolutely. clean the streets, do they? <laughs> Absolutely. But that, that's, that, that, that's the problem with Africa. I mean, that, and, and I think some level of education needs to go in to make people understand that, look, things are different now. Everyone has his, should have a sense of responsibility. Mm. The government is irresponsible for everything. I, I think if it's that's that Kennedy's statement, isn't it? Ask not what your country can do yes, for you, but what, what you can do. do for your country. We actually, the doctors and I were having a chat before mm. we came into the studio to meet you, and we were talking about we keep blaming leaders and the leadership. And I said, how about the lead? Mm. Because the leaders came from within the lead. Absolutely. So they came forth from you. So they are part of you. If you can do a better job, why don't you become the leaders then? Yes. And if you're still being the lead, then why don't you toe the line? And as he, he rightfully said, be responsible, wake up. But the issue of electricity, for example, is not really That's something that ordinary people can deal with. I mean, that comes from simply a lack of investment. A country like Nigeria, for example, last invested in electricity in 1979 and didn't do it again whilst the the population was growing geometrically they didn't invest again in it till 2005 when a new government came in and decided they were going to do something about it and now they just don't have the resources the to try and yeah to, to you know to try and sort of provide the kind of electricity that's needed so what they've done is to privatize the entire system and that's something that South Africa is actually going through at the moment I mean if, if a country like South Africa is going through this kind of problem you can imagine what was happening across the continent. Well, that's, that's a very good point, yeah, because South, South Africa, Africa like, actually it, has 40,000 megawatts of okay. electricity um, compared to Nigeria right. that has 6,000 megawatts, and yet Nigeria's population is almost More. four times yes. that of South Africa. I mean, so that tells you the disparity. In, in terms of development, South Africa is like the good child in Africa. I mean, like it's, it's a place in Africa that looks like Europe, if we are going to make comparisons. Yeah, but the problem is that it seems to be slipping. You know what I mean? It's not moving forward. The, the economy is not growing at the pace that people think it ought to be. I'm not even it's sure slowing I, down. I agree with Douglas there because when you do go to, I go to South Africa often, um, it depends on where you go. So if you say you're comparing it to, to the Western world, I'll say no. Maybe it's some parts. Not really talking about really, like really, like it. But the, to the, the rest of Africa. Africa. Yeah, the largest, the yeah. largest expand of, of, of land there, the largest expanse of land, they're just like anywhere else in Africa. There's mm. no energy, there's no light. There's no nothing. Mm. So basically, the governments in, in Africa as a whole, and because we're talking about South Africa now, need to take another look. It's actually a bit like bringing Abuja in Nigeria, which is a very modern capital, and then taking parts of Lagos and kind of putting them side by side. side. That's what you find in Johannesburg. In yes, you, true. You leave the city, you go on, and you've got these sort of so the, you know, the, the, places the, that are just The rural and the urban. Absolutely. Yeah. Living side by side. But I think, I think what also galvanizes the anger I see is I don't know if you remember, but a few weeks ago there was this whole, who, uh, this whole uh, um, discussion about how the South African president spent millions of dollars <laughs> renovating his personal residence. <gasps> now, if I'm the ordinary man on the street and I'm reading that in the newspaper and I'm oh. seeing this guy's proofing his personal residence. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, hey, you know, think about it. Twenty million dollars. Compare that to <laughs> what you see getting missing in other parts of Nigeria. Absolutely. I mean, well, that's, what, the question that's a small amount is, of money. So if one person that does twenty make million. It okay, then. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it's okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that the amount of accountability Ability. in South Africa for twenty million dollars is quite commendable compared to other places where we're talking literally mm. billions going missing uh, and nobody says anything. But Charles, that's just for the man's car. He's, the man's house, sorry. We're not mm -hmm. talking about how much he spent on other His things. Well, we'll, yeah, have exactly. to, we'll, 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 have, we'll have to leave that thought, but that's a fascinating um, <laughs> piece of discussion. Um, there's still a great deal more ahead here on Talking Africa this week as we ask our guests to look back across the last um, seven days and pick out some of the positive Africa stories that have caught their eye. Stay with us. 
thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zenith, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion. Listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance. The most customer-focused bank in Nigeria. A success built on three foundations, dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. The best way to predict the future is to create it. There's a special breed of achievers out there called tomorrow's people. They imagine what will be and strive to make it happen. They refuse to wait for the future. Tomorrow bends and conforms to their ideas. At Access Bank, we share the same sentiments. Our mantra for success is simple. Speed, service, and security. Tomorrow's people own the future because they keep the world turning. That is the power of taking tomorrow. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue conversation with my guests this week, Princess Doan and Douglas Pollin. And we asked you both to highlight some of the positive stories that have come out of Africa over the last seven days. Now, let's start with you, Princess Doan. You were a guest of the renowned billionaire, I think she's actually the richest woman in Africa, Mrs. Folorunsha Alakija this week at a breakfast business meeting for women which she hosted. Tell us about that. Um, well, first of all, it, it was uh, quite an honor to be, you know, invited amongst, you know, such wonderful women. People came from across the world. Um, what she basically wanted to do was to share her story about how her success journey started and how she became this billionaire, making us understand that it wasn't overnight. Also, that there are pitfalls along the way. And, um, they and making you understand that it's good to know who the head of state <laughs> is so he can sign a few oil blocks over to you. She didn't quite <laughs> talk about that. Oh, I didn't that, think she that would. Part yeah. of it. But um, what I found interesting was uh, the way she actually shared her story. And for the first time, I thought, OK, here's an, uh, an African woman um, who is very highly placed, you know. And she didn't have any goons around her, if I can use so those words. Quite candid, she was quite candid, very straightforward, unscripted, the, sort of direct she, she communication. Spoke, sort you know, of straight from her heart. And um, we were able to ask her a variety of questions, some personal, and she was happy to, to answer them. But one thing she did say was, um, you know, she was going to leave us with a few tips about how you can survive in the world of business. And first, she said, you need to really understand what it is to be um, business savvy. You can't just go into business thinking, oh, I know this person, I know that person, therefore everything's going to fall into place. You also have to put on your cap, your mm. thinking cap, and um, really study the environment and the particular industry you want to be in. That's one of the things she had to take on board. Secondly, is she said you must not be afraid to ask questions, that you just have to ask questions and have to keep knocking doors. Um, told us about how many times she fell and thought that it was all over mm. and felt she was going to be bankrupt. But then she thought, you know what, I've not come this far to just lie down here, so I'm going to get up again. Despite the fact that her husband laughed at her, other people laughed at her and said, you're not going to get anywhere. But today, hey, she is the Falangia. Well, that's an that inspiring <laughs> story. And um, it would be nice if she could do a little pamphlet that people could stick in their pockets and sort of she, refer to from did. time to time and at gave, moments she, of sort of, you know, downers did. and so on. Douglas, you, you have a story which caught your eye, and that was Ethiopia, which is beefing up its competition and consumer protection regulations in an effort to make its business environment safer for both domestic and foreign firms. And that will be something after your heart, because you are, of course, a, 
you know, the businessman and so on. Um, tell us about this. Absolutely. I think it's an impressive step they've taken, especially considering that Ethiopia is just, just 20 years ago, they, they, they suffered a really terrible famine and the whole world had to come help them. I think it's a very bold step as well because what we found across Africa is a lot of the governments shy away from this area because mm. they don't want to upset the private investors, they want companies to come in and no one really looks out for the domestic workforce. Mm. All, all they say is you've got the job, get on with it, don't complain. I mean people don't, don't have these jobs. I think this is something that needs to be discussed. Well, they're clearly quite serious about it because they've actually enlisted the United Nations to come in and help. Absolutely. And especially when, you, I, I think it's, it's even more important when you've got such a vulnerable workforce, you've got a lot of people living in poverty, just coming out of poverty. They, they, they don't know what to expect from an employer. I mean, many of these employers won't do what they do. Yeah, you've got to push them, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Because for them, it's all about numbers, money, mm. and profits, and, and uh, keeping absolutely. shareholders happy. Absolutely. So I, think, I think it's a very impressive direction. Well, in which we'll watch and see how that goes. Now, back to you, Princess Darren. And you wanted to talk about a lady who set up a charity to help people with a rare blood condition after she lost her 18-year-old daughter. Tell us about that. Um, this lady uh, apparently, didn't, first of all, she didn't even know uh, her daughter had that ailment. It's um, apparently very, it's, it's a rather long <laughs> name um, it's um, very similar to lupus yeah and um, very debilitating and, and after all running around and trying to save this child and you know getting all the medical attention you know here in the UK that they were um, sadly she passed and you know sometimes when we do lose especially a child you, you sort of um, wallow in sorrow mm. and and she just decided you know what I no matter how much crying I can't bring my daughter back but one thing I can do is I've researched about this ailment and I've found out that it's very common with Africans and people of African so descent. So the charity is aimed at so helping people in Healthy Africa. people in Africa who have those particular symptoms and most likely initially they never know that that is what it is because some of them look really similar mm. to each other. So what she wants to do is set up this charity which is done and say, you know, if you have a child or somebody that has these symptoms, come to me, I will point you in the right direction and we're also campaigning to make sure that the government you know pays attention to that particular blood um, disorder and help in um, the research to develop medication to enable them at least manage it if not particularly eradicate it. Well it'll be nice and, to and talk to her so if you've got her contact I, I do, do, do pass I do. it on. I will we'll definitely be happy pass it to on talk to you. her here and um, understand more about what she's doing. Now Douglas um, you wanted to talk about the appointment of Tijani Tiam, is that his name? Yeah. Who's, who's from the Ivory Coast as head of Credit Suisse. Uh, that caught your interest. Absolutely I mean I think what, what the guy has achieved is remarkable and um, I mean, he's the new CEO. Of Credit Suisse. Mm. Yeah, I mean, right at the heart of the financial institution in Switzerland. Mm. That's an impressive achievement for an African. I mean, someone born in Ivory Coast, um, he's, he's, he's occupied several remarkable positions in the UK. I think it just gives aspiring Africans hope that there's, you, there's, there's a chance for you to be able to rise to the top, to become what you want to be, no matter where you are in the world. I think I find, I find his appointment really inspirational. Yes, it's, it certainly sounds inspirational. And finally, Princess Dewan, the Zimbabwean community here in the UK are demanding the release of a political activist who was allegedly kidnapped by government security agents okay. in Zimbabwe. What more can you tell us about that? Well, the, the, just before I came to the studios, I actually um, got some updates from some of my Zimbabwean friends and who have said that for the first time, because usually Zimbabweans you know, when they're outside Zimbabwe, they don't tend to gel together. Mm. So but it's for, united. But for some them, reason, well. this has really united them. So, so who is this character, he, and, and why is he so important? Uh, well, his name is Itai um, Dejari. He's very important because he is one who is very vocal, mm. and he, he speaks his mind he, about whatever ills the government is doing. He's also he's not a, he's not a troublemaker. So he's not as if he's this. Uh, rub rouser or rude person but I think because of the way he puts out his information and I also believe that because the government don't quite understand how he gets a lot of the information that he puts out there especially on social media 
they feel threatened by this little man, if I can call him that. Right. And he's just suddenly disappeared. He has a wife, he has children, he has you know, his extended family. And the community here in the UK, the Zimbabwe community, just decided that they were going to come together. Well, we, we One thing they did was they went to the Zimbabwean High Commission, mm. which they usually never do. And they, they they had a protest. Well, we hope they'll make enough noise um, so that he can be so released. that he can be heard yeah. around the world and in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. My thanks to Princess Dawn and Douglas Pollin, and thanks Thank to you, you both sure. for coming in. Thanks also to Sierra Leonean hip hop artist and motivational speaker Aleem Kamara, who joined me earlier in the program. We're back every night with Africa Rap at 1800 GMT here on Arise News. From me, Charles Ngugolu, and from the team here in London, goodbye and thank you for watching.